Hi, and welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash podcast. Get CME for this episode by clicking on the CME link in the show notes. Today in the show, we welcome Jeffrey Fraser. He's a family physician. His Kevin MD article titled, From Addiction to Exclusion, A Physician's Struggle for Redemption. Jeffrey, welcome to the show. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for having me. So we're going to talk about your article, which also tells your story. And I know that you shared your story on a prior episode of Kevin MD. It's titled, From Addiction to Exclusion, A Physician's Struggle for Redemption. Now, tell us, how did this article come together and how did your story start? Well, I think that physicians as a whole, our profession, the consequences we face from addiction and the behaviors while we're addicted are worse than any other profession. The consequence that I face with an OIG exclusion is the worst that a physician can face. It's basically career ending. So what an OIG exclusion is that they prohibit you from prescribing or billing Medicare and Medicaid services. All right, so for those who aren't familiar with your story and didn't listen to your episode, tell us about the events or recap the events that led up to your OIG exclusion. Okay, so I'm a family doc, I own my own office. I became addicted to hydrocodone when I had prostate cancer, right? That was the first prescription I ever had, and that was part of my other story before. So I diverted their narcotic. That means I wrote prescriptions to my patients for pain, they brought it back to me and I used it for my own. Last year for about three years. So I diverted narcotics, I got caught and my license was suspended for a year in Nebraska because we don't have a PHP. And that was the topic of my last article was talking about the need for a physician's health program. So I received a letter on August 3rd of, 19, of 2021. I was practicing medicine in North Carolina after having been fully credentialed for both Medicare and Medicaid with disclosure of my felony and my, my addiction history. Practicing medicine, a small underserved community. And on August 3rd of 2021, I got a letter in the mail, just regular mail said I was excluded from Medicare and Medicaid because of my history of the felony. Not because of my addiction, just because I had the history of the felony. So when I got that letter, I informed my my attorney and the hospital administration has said, don't worry about it. We'll file for a waiver. We won't appeal this. We'll file a waiver. Just keep seeing patients and we'll get a waiver. The reason I wanted to write this article is the OIG exclusion is career ending, but there are ways to overcome it. I wanted to educate other physicians about that. How, how common are OIG exclusions and, and what are some things that physicians do to warrant getting on that list? There could be Medicare fraud any history of felony. For me, it's because I had a history of felony for diverting narcotics. It's not the the disease itself, not the addiction, and it's actually not the behavior. So many physicians that have done the same things that I did, divert narcotics, but were not with, faced with the felony, they're not going to be placed on the OIG exclusion list. Now, before you got that letter from the OIG, was it something that you would have expected? No, I did not expect that at all, especially, you know, when I applied for credentials for Medicare and Medicaid and all the commercial ones like Blue Cross Blue Shield and United Healthcare, on that form it says history of felony, history of drug addiction, and I was fully credentialed seeing patients. Not the last time I diverted narcotics was December of 2017. So I did not expect this to happen. I thought I would have been not credentialed initially, Kevin, instead of 13 months after I pleaded guilty and nine months after I'd been fully credentialed. So it just came out of the blue. It's just, I described it as a bombshell in my letter because it was just, in my article rather, because it was just unexpected. So by the time you got this letter, you were, you were re-credentialed, you were, you were seeing patients regularly as a family physician. Is that correct? Yeah, in a small town in North Carolina called Vanceboro. They had had a doctor there for three years. I would say mostly Medicare, Medicaid patients, underserved very underserved community. And I was pulled out of that because of the Medicare exclusion. All right. So you received this letter from the OIG. So tell us a story about what happened next and what your reaction was when you received this letter. Well, initially, you know, yeah, it's a bad letter, but I thought, okay, we can overcome that. So I called my administration. I called my attorney and said, don't worry about this. Since you're working in an underserved area, we will file for a waiver of this exclusion. Just said, sit tight, keep seeing patients, don't worry about it. So that's what I did. So that was the lawyer who said that or your administration who said that? Both the administration and my attorney. 
Yes. Said that. Okay. And what happened next? So three weeks later, the hospital administration for Carolina East Health Systems in North Carolina fired me. They said that the CEO said he not, did not know it was a felon when they hired me. So even if they got the waiver, that he couldn't employ me, which is ridiculous. They knew my entire history before I even went out there. Involved in getting the waiver was a congressman in North Carolina, the state Medicaid director, all were lined up ready to work on getting this waiver in this small town until I was just fired. And I've been working to get back into medicine since then. And how long ago was that when you got fired? It was August 26, 2021. And I've been fighting it since 1030 that morning, Kevin. Now, in terms of your legal options after that, you talked to your attorney and what was some of your attorney's counsel in terms of options that you had? The options that I had were to file an appeal. You have 60 days from receipt, receipt of the letter to file an appeal. I was told specifically not to file an appeal, which I should have because they were going to get this waiver. He said, the easiest thing we can do is get a waiver of this exclusion since you're working in a small town. Then it became complex because a congressman got involved, community members got involved, other physicians got involved, it went back and forth for a period of time where they tried to convince the CEO to change his mind, to say, don't do this to this doctor. But regardless, after by the time that they finally made their decision to let me go, the 60 days had expired. Okay. I contacted the OIG exclusion office and tried to file an appeal, but they said it was too late. So the the CEO could have just changed their mind and you could have stayed employed. So this was solely on the CEO and, and their decision? It, it was solely on that decision. For him to say that he did not was a felon, it was just absolutely ludicrous. I mean, my attorney worked for them as well. Great guy still my attorney he knew my history when i was getting my north carolina license he told him my entire history i told the vice president everybody my my history they filled out the forms for me for my applications for all my prevention were filled out by that by that group so to say they didn't yeah he could have just said everything was in place to work on getting this waiver done if he would not have fired me yes so how have your last you know, year, year and a half been in terms of looking for employment, in terms of appealing a decision, and in terms of what you've been doing to uh, get back on your feet after this. To tell us about that. Great question. So in interestingly, in the interim, I've been hired by the government, Health and Human Services. I now work for SAMHSA as a senior public health advisor analyst and for HHS. And, but I'm still working to get back into practice of medicine. So. Here's how to work through this. State Medicaid directors in both North, North Carolina and in Nebraska have agreed to try to find a place for me to work by filing a waiver. Also, I have a congressman, Greg Murphy, and North Carolina has been great from the start. He's still working on trying to help me get this done. So just to expand on that a little bit. So to get an OIG exclusion, I was told by the exclusion office, you're going to file for a Medicaid waiver, and then also that will get your Medicaid waiver. So in a small town, Nebraska, Aurora, Nebraska, we got a Medicaid approval for the waiver, but they denied Medicare. Medicare denied that same appeal within the same numbers. Same thing in North Carolina, small town of 200 people called Sarah Gordon, North Carolina. They agreed to and gave me a waiver for Medicaid, but they denied it on Medicare within the same numbers. If I can give you some examples on that, if you'd like, Kevin. Sure. So the town of Aurora, Nebraska, they have four physicians, two are retiring, one works part-time. They also cover two satellite clinics. That's all they have there. There's one group in the entire town, a small farm community in, in central Nebraska. So the Medicaid waiver was approved, but Medicare denied it, saying that there were 14 family doctors in the town, 49, 49 doctors, 14 individual primary care offices in Aurora. And they said within a 30 mile radius, there were 348 physicians, family doctors, and 148 separate unique family practice offices. So we asked them to, we disputed that. And they said, well, we do not 
second guess what Medicare provides to us. So we're still working on that. I have a lot of good people working on a congressman, an ex attorney general for Nebraska, the state Medicaid directors. When I finish this call, I'll be talking to the state Medicaid director for Nebraska and trying to ask Medicare to relook at these numbers because if they granted it for Medicaid, we're not sure why they won't do it for Medicare. Now, historically, just because I'm not familiar with the numbers, physicians who are on the OIG exclusion list, are there a percentage of them that eventually can start practicing again? I don't know what the percentage is. In Nebraska, I'm the only one, the first one that's ever happened to, so it's unique. The state Medicaid director said, we'd love to help you, but we've never had to do this before. And same thing in North Carolina, it's a very rare thing. I do not know the percentage of doctors that actually are able to overcome this. Have you heard stories of any successful cases? Rare cases, like if I could speak another language, like maybe Portuguese or another language, they say perhaps I would help. But so for to get the waiver, they ideally say you have to be the sole provider in a community. Well, there's not any community, even in remote Nebraska or remote Alaska, for where you're going to be the only doctor. So they Medicare Medicaid did not approve it, knowing that I would not be the only doctor, but I'll be one of few doctors. So. I don't know the statistics. It's a really complex thing, and it's actually very unique that it happens. In Nebraska, I'm the first one to refer to. Now, short of this waiver, are there any other options? Yes. That would, that would, that would have you practice again. So, going back, passing the appeal stage, the next, the only way to do it is get a presidential pardon, which I have. Sent a letter to Biden requesting a presidential pardon. Initially, I had a congressman in Nebraska that was advocating for me on that, but he's not in office anymore. So I was told that it's sitting in the Office of Presidential Pardons, which is in the Department of Justice, just sitting there. I was told initially this looks like a very good case. So if you get a presidential pardon, the OIG exclusion goes away, and I can get my life back to practicing medicine. Now, in terms of this applies to Medicare and Medicaid now, again, would you, if you don't get this waiver, would you be able to accept cash only patients? You know, what about commercial insurers? What about patients outside of Medicare and Medicaid? It's a good question. If you don't a direct primary care practice, and I have looked into that, but it's hard to make money for at least several years doing a direct primary care practice. It can be lucrative, but in the meantime, you have to have a salary coming in and, you know, revenue coming in. What tends to happen is if Medicare and Medicaid exclude you, then the other commercial insurance companies follow that lead. When I was credentialed for Medicare and Medicaid, they came on really quick. The first insurance company that approved me was United Healthcare within, when I initially did this, Kevin, and then Medicare and Medicaid followed, and then everybody else just like that. So you can only, you can have a direct primary care practice where you do a cash only basis. If you have enough funds to support yourself, during the three years or so that it takes to establish a practice. Now, if a physician is in the unfortunate circumstance of getting on the OIG exclusion list, what kind of advice do you have for that physician? My attorneys did not know, and I did not know the ramifications of what happened when I pleaded guilty to my felony. I would say that if you don't accept a plea deal, I think that a jury would have been more understanding my situation and my actions were based on my addiction, not because of just immoral behavior, which I think the, the medical system can look at us. So I would, I would not have accepted the plea deal. I would have gone to trial. And think, when you did accept the plea deal, you had no idea of this potential ramification. Correct. I did not know this was going to occur. My attorneys did not warn me about this. Actually, the U S attorney that was prosecuting me, the assistant said, we want to do everything we can to get you back into practicing medicine. She the prosecuted she advocated, said that. Yeah. Not knowing what would happen if you did have a felony. It, it's not good. I did not get good advice. We're talking to Jeffrey Fraser. He's a family physician. His Kevin MD article is titled From Addiction to Exclusion, A Physician's Struggle for Redemption. Jeffrey, tell us some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience. My message would be that if you get charged with a felony for diverting narcotics, a federal felony, do everything you can not to accept a plea deal. Do not, a felony is career ending. 
So do everything you can to negotiate with the prosecutor. I would have rather go to trial. Jeffrey, thank you so much for sharing your story, time, and insight. Thanks again for being on the show. Thanks, Kevin. 